concrete walls There's a place for us Where we could go, where we could be alone Between city lights, we don't have to hide I wanna go, do you wanna follow? There's something in the air, I can't explain it but it's there Ain't nobody gonna find us in our secrets of affair I don't wanna have to hide no more, it shouldn't be I wanna go and I wanna know Do you wanna follow? What's up you guys happy sunday it's time for the q a how how is it uh one minute before how is it one minute before the go live time i started it four minutes oh well anyway what's up you guys welcome to the live stream i'm joshua bardwell you probably already knew that though we're gonna do some q a today what's up chat hello albuquerque i love the word albuquerque don't know why just do just a fun a fun thing <clears throat> oh that's good i'm collecting i've decided to start crowdsourcing my news of the day um because many times a week goes by and i've got my head down doing uh doing you know working on videos and everything and uh then uh, then it comes to the stream and i'm like nothing happened this week but i'm sure that's not true so i'm hitting you guys up in the chat for uh news of the day as well i have a few things though before we start taking questions and we are going to start taking questions because that's mostly what you're here i say that some people say they tune in for the news of the day and then they leave and they don't stay for the q a hey whatever whatever gets you out of bed in the morning yeah uh, that's all good for me so we're going to answer questions here's what I no that's not right wow there we go that's what i got going on that's my main screen right here Got you guys in the chat. What's your preferable drone racing simulator? Ooh, Matthew Bowman. That's a good question, which I am going to now completely avoid to avoid pissing off any of the drone simulator manufacturers who all do a lot of good work. <laughs> I will say that Liftoff has my house in it, so that is uh, something that you can't get anywhere else. Mm. Pennsylvania, coming at ya. Coming at ya. Um... So I'm going to start taking your questions in just a little bit. 
And uh, But before we do that, let's get some news out of the way. And the first piece of news that I want to share with you guys is... No! Wrong way! My, my f screens are flipped. It thinks OBS thinks my left screen is my right screen and my right screen is my left screen. That's going to keep happening all live streams, so I apologize for that. The first piece of news of the day, this one was submitted by It's Blunty over on my Discord. Um, this is the Tiny Talent stack, and it is the first 16x16 F7 stack. Is that, that? I don't even know. Let's like take a look. Yeah, so here is the good old F7 chip. And taking up almost the entirety of the 16 by 16 board. Uh, way to go. Uh, you did it. And here's the here's the Max chip right here, the OSD chip. I don't even know how you accomplished this. I'm not even sure you should have accomplished this, but you did. There you go. Heli Nation Talon, the first 16 by 16 F7. That's very exciting. Um, so check that out. Another piece of news of the day. News of the day. UAV Tech covered this uh, seven hours ago. There is an official phone app, an official Android app. Now, I'm just going to go to his... There we go. I'm going to steal his content. Thank you, UAV Tech, uh, for covering this. Th there has been an Android version of the configurator that you could kind of get on. Your, it was nothing official, though. Uh, but this is really exciting because, as you can see, it has the actual like sliders and stuff it's the actual beta flight app now you you may be using the speedy b app which is made by i think speedy b is run cam i think i could be wrong about that but you may be using the speedy b app uh, already and the problem is that the speedy b app is sometimes out of sync with beta flight so beta flight releases a new version but the speedy b app doesn't support it yet if this app is being developed by the actual Betaflight developers, which, in fact, it is. So here is the official GitHub repo for the... Damn it. <laughs> here's the official... That's going to keep happening. I don't know why my screen is like that. The, uh, here's the official GitHub repo for the Betaflight configurator. And sure enough, Betaflight configurator android.apk. Now, at the moment, you cannot get this from the Android App Store. Okay, you have to sideload this, which means that you download the APK and you install it on your phone using your computer. Eventually, presumably, it will end up in the Android App Store, but this is a preview version, and that's pretty exciting. Um, not that it's going to put SpeedyB like out of business, I mean, but it definitely means that all the latest features will be there on day one. SpeedyB definitely does have the CLI H2 a Lobo. I'm really, I'm pretty sure about that. One more piece of news I want to share with you guys is this. Now, this is way more exciting than it seems at first. What we're looking at here, this is uh, shared with me by a guy named Curtis Bangert. And let's see here. What this is, is the Betaflight OSD menu. So this is not a Lua script. Well, it's a Lua script, but you know how every time Betaflight releases a new uh, a new version, the Lua script goes out of date or there's some feature that, that the Lua script doesn't support? Well, what this is doing is it's basically giving you these options over the Crossfire link, okay? So as he moves through the menu here, this is not this menu is being generated by the flight controller. And what that means is that every time Betaflight has a new version come out, this menu will just be updated automatically and will always be sort of up to date. There's nothing to update on your radio. It just comes from the radio. That's pretty slick. Um, this is a new feature that's being worked on. Uh, probably going to be, re he thinks it's going to be released in the next version of Betaflight 4.3. One of the downsides of this feature is that it currently only works over Crossfire because the Crossfire telemetry link is fast enough to carry all this data. And the other telemetry links like Smartport and Fport aren't, they can't carry this much data. So, uh, but it's pretty slick and I wish this would be more widely implemented if it only works on Crossfire, then it's not. there are going to be a lot of people who can't use it. But it does mean that you can access these features from your radio 
it's always up to date and uh, you don't need to do any you will run a Lua script on the radio but the actual contents of the menu are generated by the flight controller not the Lua script itself so that's pretty slick um, and that's what I got that's what I got that's what I got this week nothing else happened in the whole world this week <sighs> nothing at all in the whole world <laughs> um, let's see here will they do an iOS release of it asks fear for fun unknown unknown whether I mean that that all the devs work for free, so they either they'll do what they do or they don't what they do what they don't do what they don't do. Okay. Oh man. All right. So that's it. Um, end of the news. If you guys, let me ask you: if you guys have any other newsworthy issues that happened in the last couple of weeks that I haven't covered, will you let me know? Will you send an email? I should just make a special email box but i haven't done that but um will you just message me message me send me an email let me know like something interesting that you think needs to be covered um i would like to be a little more organized about the news of the day but some like i said a lot of times i'm just heads down working on videos and i just don't even look up so you guys are welcome to to do that okay let's do some questions um i'm gonna be taking questions here from the youtube chat how do you like brushed tiny whoops honestly maxim l brushless tiny whoops have gotten so good that i i don't mess with brushed ones anymore uh sorry man that's just it um there you go just like that answering questions um if you want to make sure i get to your question hit that dollar sign right down here uh it lets you contribute a couple bucks and you get called out in a super chat, which I definitely will get your question if you leave a super chat. Like uh, like this guy here, Just Perchard. I don't know who you are, what, how to say your name. Just Perchard really wants to know if I could only have three quads, what would you have? To be honest with you, I'm not that interested in that question. No offense intended. I just like, I don't know. If you were to put that in a super chat, I would be obligated to answer it. But I probably am not gonna, I'm probably just like, eh, that's not that interesting to me. Uh, so that's that's the kind of thing that you would put in a super chat. Also, hello, Hashenberg, Anders Martinson up here in the upper right. These folks, these lovely folks here. Um, it's Blunty. Don't do that. You guys, don't do this. Don't do that. Um, I can actually, it's Blunty. I can actually make, I own the domain. I can just make a new email address if I want to. So I'm not going to do that. But I might, I might make an, an email address. Mm. Uh, these lovely people up here are my patrons. If you want to become one of them, I will pay extra attention to you during live streams. And you will get a good feeling of of supporting me. That's how that's how it works. Here's a great question from Michael Pitali, who asks, JB, if one owns private land, can one fly on it without any hassle from the FAA? Now, the on, my Sunday afternoon stream is technically my European stream. Uh, I... <laughs> I stream it uh, in the afternoon on Sunday um, so that the Europeans can watch in the evening. But I will, I, I mean, I'm not going to only answer questions pertaining to Europe. I, I do want to acknowledge, though, that the rules about what you can and can't do depend on where you live. Uh, so, for example, in the United States, the FAA regulate has the exclusive and sole right to regulate uh, the airspace. I just remembered one more newsworthy thing I want to get. Uh, one second. Uh, this is so important. I'm going to pause myself. I'm going to interrupt myself to do this. Uh, what's the freaking group? What's the freaking group? Sorry, guys. Uh, UAV legal news and discussion. Okay, I got I got one more. Okay, I'm gonna I'll get back to that in a second. So what what that means is that if you own private land, once you enter the airspace above your private land, you you don't own it. Now, there have been some fights about this. The most famous case I know of is U.S. versus Cosby, uh, and in that case, 
Um, I'm not a lawyer, and I'm going to get some of these details wrong, so forgive me. But the gist of it was that this guy had a chicken farm, and the airplanes were flying low over his chicken farm. They were He was at, like, at the end of a landing strip, and if airplanes were freaking his chickens out. And he said he sued, saying that the government was depriving him of, like, his property or whatever. And the takeaway from that is that if you are using that space in some way and the government deprives you of your use of the space, then you, they have to compensate you for it. That's, the, I, that's, how, I, that's how I remember that case. Uh, but it doesn't mean that the government can't use that airspace. And it doesn't mean that you have the exclusive right to tell the government what it can do with that airspace. In other words, if you, you don't really own the airspace over your property, you have the right, like if you want to put up a 50 foot tower up into the airspace, Hey, that's your property. You can do it. But as soon as you take an aircraft off, now you're in the national airspace. You're not in your private airspace and you can't do whatever you want. There's another takeaway from this national, this, this federal preemption, you could call it, which says that only the government, and this is enshrined in law, that only the government may regulate the national airspace, the federal government, which is that local governments are not allowed to make laws that regulate the national airspace. So, for example, if a town, and this happens, this has happened, which is leading to the, the other news story I want to share with you guys, if a town makes a law that says you can't fly a drone in our airspace, that is actually not legal for them to do. The federal government has the exclusive right to regulate the national airspace. Towns, states, they do not have the right to do that. The way that towns get around that is to say that you can't take off or land from within the, the boundaries. And that they're allowed to do. Interestingly, a takeoff and a landing is a behavior that the state or a town or a city can regulate, but the flight is not. So, to answer your question, to answer your question, no. If you have private property, the airspace above your property is the government's. You cannot fly your drone above your own property and as if you were not part of the national airspace. Um, now, that's stupid. That's stupid because I, I really I really feel it's, it's tough. It's stupid to say that you're presenting a danger to the national airspace when you're flying a drone 50 feet uh, around your trees in your yard. No air, aircraft are going to go down there. The flip side is that there is a very good argument why this preemption is necessary. Think about what would have to – if let's say that you own the airspace above your property – and now I say, you know what? I don't want anybody flying airplanes over my house. Delta, United, get, get your airplanes out of my airspace. Okay, that's stupid. The ability for the government to say, look, we're going to create rights of way in the air, that's meaningful. I, I, I feel like saying like the 400-foot boundary or even a 200-foot boundary, I don't know, to say that, that below that, then it sort of makes sense. But even then, I'm not sure I would be comfortable with saying that individual property owners have the right to prevent overflights of their property. I mean, if I put a drone up in the air and I want to go out and do a flight, the fact that I pass over your house, that's, I don't know, that's, I'm sure that's any of your business. Anyway, but what I don't know, I don't know how that, how does that work like in Europe or whatever? Like, what are the rules there? Don't know. J10163 says you can't fly a drone, but you can kick a football that's heavier. Yeah, um, the key thing there is powered and under control. So the difference between a paper air, people are like, well, what if I throw a paper airplane? Is that the FAA's business? The FAA defines it as if it's under control and power. So a paper airplane is neither under control, nor is it under power. Therefore, they don't regulate it. That's the same reason why a kite, a kite a tethered kite is dip. people have said well kites are legal and balloons are legal so why don't i tie a string to my drone well it's under power and control which a balloon is not anyway maxim l says what kind of insurance should i get for flying my five inch man i have no idea um 
being able to get someone to insure your, your five inch is pretty tricky. Uh, you could get a general liability policy, but you would want to make absolutely sure that the person who writes the policy understands your intended use. Like I asked, I asked my homeowner's insurance, can you insure, like I have a business, right? I have, I have uh, business related things. I have cameras, for example, that I use to shoot videos. And I thought to myself, if I ever get I have a fire in my house or something, God forbid, my insurance policy might not cover all of this stuff because the, my homeowner's policy isn't normally expected to cover like business expense stuff. I don't know. So I said, hey, can you write me a policy for my business? And they said, we're not covering any of your drones. I was like, I don't want you to cover my drones while I'm flying. Can you just cover them while they're sitting in my house if there's like a fire? And they were like, no. And my point is that your specific insurance policy you need to tell them if you buy general liability i will be flying racing drones and i specifically want to make sure i have policy you know if i crash into somebody's face that i'm covered so let me do this one last news thing that relates to, damn it it's going to keep happening uh this is a big freaking deal and i i don't normally do a lot of like promotion of various GoFundMe's, but this one is important and I, you guys need to know about it. I may even make my own video to, to, to signal boost this some more. This is a situation that is egregiously wrong and potentially could affect all of us legally until the FAA makes it illegal for us to fly anyway, so who cares? <clears throat> but in this situation, now, I want you to know I've been following this situation over on the UAV Law News and Discussion Facebook group. These guys know more about UAV law in the United States than anybody. There are so many. There are ex-FAA uh, inspectors here. There are lawyers here. These guys are the top of the top. I've been following this case, so I want you to know that when I give you this summary of what happened, I'm I'm giving you the short version, but I, I have I've like I've researched this. I know that I know the facts. Um, and what happened here is this guy flew his drone over his own property. Where's the summary? He's got a summary of it somewhere. Is it here? Lincoln Parish. Yeah. This guy flew a drone over his own property. His neighbor is a deputy or something, a law enforcement officer. The neighbor said that he flew the drone over his property. He has been convicted of a non-existent crime. It's a non-existent crime for two... Let me zoom in so you can like read this while I talk. It's a non-existent crime because, number one, the law they charged him under didn't include drones at the time that he flew. And they changed the law after they charged him. To cover drones, which you should, that doesn't seem like you should be able to get away with that. Um, but then the other thing is that, then this is the reason this is relevant to you. Lincoln Parish does not have the right to regulate drone flights. Only the federal government can do that. And if this case gets to stand, it will start to undermine that and make it possible for all these stupid little backwater towns to make stupid laws that affect the people who try to fly there. Right now, the FAA is the only one who can screw us over. But if this stands, then number one, this poor guy. So this judge, I mean, this you know, small town, you know how it is, law enforcement judges. He went to court and he was found guilty of this thing that wasn't illegal at the time that he did it and should never have been illegal anyway. This needs to be appealed so that a federal preemption, so number one, so that this guy can get justice. He is now prohibited, I think he has jail time. He is now prohibited from ever owning a drone again because he flew near a police officer's property, not above, and and uh, so if you feel like supporting this guy's GoFundMe, I definitely encourage that. This guy needs to be able to appeal this so he can get justice and so that there doesn't start to be a, um, a an erosion of drone of, of a federal preemption, federal non-preemption. If you're not convinced, read more about this case. The more you read about this case, 
the more outrageous it is. It is just a case where a cop in a small town is beating up his neighbor and using the power of the state to do that. And it's just wrong, 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 wrong. Anyway, okay, get back to the questions. Let's get back to the questions. Whew. Let's get some super chats out of the way. We got some super chats coming in. Aroma, thank you for one euro. Cozy FPV, thanks for $5. How are you liking the dronesaver.com prototype? When can we expect the review video? Oh, let's share this. Cozy FPV sent me this. Um, this is a big video, Cozy, so don't, uh, duh, I can't give you, oh, damn it. Sorry. This is a big video, so I can't give you a date as to when the the review is going to come out. Uh, I'm, I'm working on a video comparing a whole bunch of different drone retrieval methods, and the drone saver, Cozy sent me one of these. Basically, one of the ways to get a drone out of a tree is with a big pole. But, and there are various types of big poles you can get, but this one is, no, I don't want any music. Let me make sure this is muted. Um, the drone saver is a great big, can we, can we see the pole? Where can we see the pole though? This is all from the quads view. There it is. You can just barely see that yellow pole sticking. It is a super lightweight, like 40 foot long fiberglass pole that you can use to retrieve a quad from a tree. I haven't, uh, yeah, I got a potato gun. I got a slingshot. I'm going to try the good old, just a water bottle with a string tied to it. Where's the picture of the actual product though, Cozy? Like here's a, see it in action or in the field on our Instagram. Where's the actual product? Come on, our products. Let's see. Um, compared to, oh, here's a great picture. There's a great picture right there, but I can't zoom in on the picture. Oh, here we go. Again, I can't zoom in. Open in, no. Uh, it's kind of hard to show off your product because your website is kind of getting in my way. Anyway, um, so it should be very interesting uh, to see. What is a potato gun, H2O Lobo? Potato, it's a pneumatic. It is a pneumatic. You charge it up with air pressure from like a, from like an air compressor, and then you stick a potato in the end, and it boom, fires the potato. Uh, and you can use a potato gun to fire an arborist weight and line. Oh, this guy's got a trigger and everything. Anyway, potato gun. Cute. Uh, it's even got a freaking. It's even got a freaking compensator on it, like a like a, a fifty caliber, like a Barrett. That's cute. Uh, thank you for sending that, cozy. Uh, working on the video. It's a big video though. Riding Durant's. Thank you for five bucks. How do I get LQ from Crossfire in the DJI Betaflight OSD? Riding Durant's. There is no way to get LQ directly into the DJI OSD. What you need to do is use the old way, where you put LQ on an aux channel using using uh, the, the, the Crossfire receiver configuration. You put LQ on an aux channel, and then that aux channel comes into the flight controller as RSSI, but you know that it's really LQ. You follow? And then the flight controller says to the DJI goggle, because the DJI goggle does support RSSI from the flight controller. So the DJI goggle says, here's your RSSI, but you know that it's really LQ. That's the takeaway. modeler says hmm this telescopic pole is an antenna mask that radio amateurs use yeah modeler i have heard other people say i don't know the actual origin of this this uh product put out by cozy that it's another product that he's relabeling i don't care whatever if you know where to get this product cheaper go for it uh in the meantime in the meantime you can buy it from him Let's see here. Oh, that guy is using hairspray and a barbecue igniter instead of uh instead of oh my god. <laughs> instead of a pneumatic cannon. That's something. Um Robocop FPV, thanks for ten dollars in the super chat. I have J E H E Aria thirty two ESCs on a new five inch racing build. I'm having problems finding firmware to update it so I can run bi directional D shot. 
Protocol unknown when I read the setup. Well, are you sure they're BL Heli 32? And do they come with a stock JHE Aria 32 PB6? Let's look at this wiki page, BL Heli 32 manual. Like when you read setup, if it says protocol unknown, I would be very hesitant to flash firmware to it. I would be very hesitant. Yeah. Uh, to flash firmware to it if I wasn't 100% sure what the correct uh, ESC type. This looks like this is a BL Heli 30. Wait a minute. Robocop, does it. You sh are you sure you're using BL Heli 32 and not BL Heli S? It's a BL Heli 32 ESC, so as long as you can put Rev 32.7 on it, you should be able to use bidirectional D shot. So it looks like JHE Aria 32 is acknowledged in this manual as a BL32 ESC. Um, usually that would be the name of the file you would flash. So um, I don't know if I can actually demonstrate this to you without plugging in a quad. Uh, hang on. Uh, RC Utilities. BLA Suite 32. Can I open BLA Suite 32 and just see the flasher without actually? No. I have to have an ESC connected. I think if we go to the download page, though. If we just go to the download page, I think we're going to find. Where is the actual hex file? So, oh, they don't give you the hex files. Damn it. No, I, okay, so I can't demonstrate this for you. Though It should be there. JHG Area 32 just should be there, I think. If it's not, uh, I don't know. That shows up as a, as a downloadable, though. But I would, I would, I mean, what do you got to lose? I mean, I guess if you flash it and you screw it up, you could brick the ESC. You could usually reflash uh, BL Heli 32, though. Wills Gladdle, thank you for two pounds. Runcam Hybrid or Cadex Tarsier? I didn't like the hybrid when I flew it. Uh, I thought the exposure was like all over the place. Bright, dark, bright, dark. I guess I would take the Tarsier. Um, I guess I would take the Tarsier. Aroma, thanks for two euros. JB Polyfuse balance board in EU German warehouse. Aroma, that is entirely up to the uh, European the European distributors to order it. I don't know. I mean, they may just have decided not to carry it. It's been it's in stock at ReadyMade RC. I checked this on last week's live stream, um, but no, we can't. You have to ask your retailer. It's not like I have a, yeah, I'm just going to get that in my European warehouse. I don't have a European warehouse. I don't have a warehouse. I don't run a store. Whoever your local store is, flyingmachines.de, for example, in Germany, call them up. Say, I would like to buy the JB Parallel Charge Board. Why don't you carry it? And then they can order it and ReadyMade RC will send it to them. But I can't make that happen. You have to make that happen. Um, I'll Obviously, we'll sell them to anyone who wants to buy them. The problem is that the mar they end up being very expensive when they come from the U.S. because the the shipping and so forth is and the import duty is a lot, and that's why a lot of European shops don't carry them. Will's Gledel, thank you for two pounds. What three quad? Okay, Will's also wants to know if I could only have three quads, what would they be? A DJI Mavic for photography stuff. Maybe the Mavic Mini. That's the one I currently own. A 5-inch freestyle quad with 6-inch arms. So I have the option to fly 5-inch or 6-inch depending on what I'm going for. And a brushless 65mm micro. Those would be my choices. And if you say acro quads only and take out the Mavic... And then a Cinewhoop. Yep. I think that covers the bases. Who 
Strap FPV in the regular chat wants to know if I'm going to fix my Apex. Kiss ESC or BL Heli 32 Fet Tech. Strap FPV, I think that I would like to keep that build Kiss for now. I would love to put a Fet Tech ESC on there. I have been trying to find the 30 millimeter 45 amp Fet Tech ESC, but nobody has it in stock. Everybody has the 20 millimeter Fet Tech, and I, I am not willing to try to shoehorn that into that build. Um, so I would love to put the uh, Fet Tech ESC back on that steel build. No Beast Class. No, the Eveling Beast Class is like, if you could only have three cars, I don't know, three cars is more than enough for anybody. That's a terrible example. Beast Class is like owning a, a supercar, you know? It's like, it's really cool and showy and fun, but you definitely don't want it as your daily driver. It's expensive. It's not as fast as a five inch. It's not as agile as a five inch. And the minute you crash it, you've just spent $500. So um, Beast Class, if I only had three, Beast Class would not be on the list. I mean, a, a Cinewhoop, I'm gonna use that all the time. A, 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 a Tiny Whoop, all the time. But not a, I don't know about a Beast Class. I mean, Beast Class is fun, but. Um, Peter Pan, thanks for $5 in the super chat. I have a Beta FPV 85 HD running the Cadex V2 with a DVR. It took a crash. Now I have no video. Screen is just black, but I do have OSD, just no video. Ouch. Peter Pan, if you have OSD, then that tells you that the flight controller and the video transmitter are working correctly because the flight controller makes the OSD, the video transmitter sends it. The issue is in the camera or between the camera and the flight controller. So you have a broken camera or you have broken wiring between the camera and the flight controller or the flight controller camera input is broken or the voltage regulator that powers the camera could be broken. But I'm going to guess that that probably powers other things. So that's probably not it. Speed of sound. Thanks for five bucks. I'm having a hard time finding information of the best five inch prop for flying freestyle on 6S. Speed of sound. There is no one right answer there, my friend. Um, for example, I used to think that the Mr. Steel, the Ethics S3 watermelon props were really overrated uh, because I tried them on a whole bunch of different quads. People were like, these are the best freestyle props I've ever flown. And I tried them on a whole bunch of different quads and I was like, there's totally, n it must be that people are just in love with Mr. Steel and hyping these product because there's nothing special about it. And then I flew those props on his quad which is 50 or 75 grams lighter than anything I own. And I was suddenly I was like, oh, oh. So, um, yeah. So the bright prop depends on your build. I like the Gemfan Hurricane 51433 as a general purpose all round freestyle prop. If you're just starting out and you kind of just want something that probably will work well for you, it has enough thrust to give you decent punch outs and decent speed, decent cornering. It's not so over the top that it'll have terrible prop wash handling. Um, I think that's a fine all around prop. If you have a lightweight build, the Ethics S3 Watermelon is a good choice. Uh, yeah. Let's see here. Andy Shin. That's a good one. I mean, I'm going to skip. I'm going to stop doing super chats for this one for a minute. Take some questions from my discord now. Uh, me, myself and I wants to know if the missing camera image from Peter Pan could be an NTSC PAL configuration issue. Um, it's it's theoretically possible that having the OSD set to the wrong NTSC or PAL would cause black screen. Usually that causes no OSD, but the key thing is Peter Pan, he said he, it happened after a crash and that's not an NTSC PAL mismatch. Alep FPV says the FET Tech 30 by 30 is in the middle of an update cycle. They're rolling out V1.1, which has TVS diodes for added protection against spikes. Great, when can I buy it? FET Tech, when can I have a, Hey, uh, Vic, Vic FPV, when can I have, can you, can I have one of those to put in that build? Fet Tech, can I put one of those in this Mr. Steel build, please? Could you, could you, could you please? Could I please? Okay. I would love to do that. 
JC Horn says you can get a 20 millimeter ESC under a 30 millimeter flight controller. No, I don't wanna though. I don't wanna. So I don't wanna change the flight controller out because I wanna try a couple other things and I don't wanna ch change Mr. Steel's PIDs and so forth. I wanna see, you know, how it flies. So I'd love to get a good, I mean, the next thing I'll probably do is put a, a BL Heli ESC in it. But the problem is that you can't flash BL Heli ESCs or change the configuration using a KISS flight controller. It doesn't support pass-through, at least it never, it didn't used to. Bannister Post says, I've set up Crossfire and I'm using the TBS Tango 2. I'm trying to set up RSSI and LQ to display on the Tango 2 screen. Um, I don't think that Tango 2 supports the ability to put like telemetry widgets on screen. But the first thing I would do is I would go to the telemetry screen in the, ta in the Tango 2, go to the telemetry screen and discover sensors and see if the RSSI and LQ show up there. They, they should, if the receiver is bound. At that point, it may it may support the ability to have a, a telemetry screen, but you can't do like, the, like the, the radios with the great big screen where you can just put the widgets up at the top of the screen. Tango can't do that. That's for sure. Kieran says, oh, that's nice. Uh, aroma, Aroma. Asking about the JB parallel charge board in the German warehouse. Uh, apparently, thank you, Kieran. The he s says he spoke to Hobby RC in the UK. They have the parallel board on order and should get it soon. That's nice. Uh, UK not technically part of the EU anymore, but you never know. Um. Off axis FPV in the YouTube chat. Can you help me understand how to know what milliamp hour to use on a setup on custom builds? Off axis FPV, the, the, the thing about battery size is there's no, unlike voltage, where if you use the wrong battery voltage, you can fry things. Milliamp hours, you can't get that wrong. If the battery is too small, the quad will not fly for very long. If the battery is too big, the quad will be too heavy and it'll fly like crap. So really when you're sizing the milliamp hours of a battery, you're, you're mostly going off the weight of the battery. A good rule of thumb is that the battery shouldn't be more than about one third the total weight of the quadcopter, including the battery. So on a 600 gram quadcopter, you want a battery to be less than about 200 grams. Some people would say that they would prefer to be a little more conservative, especially as you go down to smaller quadcopters like toothpicks and stuff, you can get to a point where you have more than a third of the weight. Um, like, yeah, so, so there's a little variance there. But in general, if you shoot to have the battery being about a third of the total weight of the quad or less, or you could rephrase that as half the weight of the quad without the battery, um, see it's the same thing, uh, then your milliamp hour will be about right. Um, I think also that may, that may get out of whack for really big quadcopters, like big heavy lift quadcopters with a, a 30 kilogram payload or not 30, 30 kilogram, 30 pound. Big heavy lift quadcopters, I think it's 30 pounds. The big heavier quadcopters, they have more room to lift batteries. So when, once you get to the great big ones, they may have heavier batteries too, I don't know. But it's a good rule of thumb. Remote controlled Panda says, I put a 800 gram battery on my 650 gram 10 inch quad. Uh, so you're like at more than 50%. I mean, for a camera rig, maybe that'll work, but not for an acro rig. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm talking about from the perspective of acro and freestyle. <laughs> Dan, to, Dan to Q man says... Once I have tested and improved the Mr. Steel Quad market and sell Mr. Steel Plus model for two hundred dollars less, uh, Dan to Q man, I would I would never do that, um, uh, because number one, 
you know, that would just be a slap in the face to Mr. Steele, and that would be rude. Uh, but also, like, he's not kidding when he says he has put years and years of work in refining this design. Um, one of the key things to take away when someone is saying this is a good product is what their values and priorities are, okay? So, like, think about guitars, okay, right? Some people play classical guitar. Some people play, like, rock guitar. Some people play heavy metal. And they play different guitars, like the heavy metal guitarists that play an Ibanez. The rocker, they could play a, a, a Stratocaster, right? Get country music, they may play a Telecaster. And you ask each of those guys, what's the absolute best guitar? And, and they're each going to give you a different answer. And that which one is giving you the right answer is going to depend on what kind of music you want to play. Okay, I'm going to stretch the analogy a little, but I think you get the point. Mr. Seal's quad is not the perfect quad for every, like, uh, cricket. Cricket or, or, or Vortex. They fly, look at Cricket's frame, look at Jeff Vortex's bandolero frame. They are big, heavy. The goal of those frames is to never break. But they're heavy. Mr. Steel would say that those frames, quads fly like crap. And if they were to fly Mr. Steel's quad, they would say that it breaks too easy. I don't mean to put words in their mouth. I'm just stereotyping. So I, I couldn't make Mr. Steel's quad better than Mr. Steel could because I haven't spent the last six years being Mr. Steel refining that. And when I put out a quad or, or a build that's – like look at my ultimate freestyle build from two years ago. I need to update that. I'm sure that he would feel that that's way too heavy and flies like crap and he would hate it. But many people like it. So I would never – I would just put out the JB, whatever. Here's the thing. If you want Mr. Steele's quad for six hundred for, for two hundred dollars cheaper, you can buy those exact parts from Team Black Sheet. Other people when 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 people said the markup on Steele's quad is too too high, why would anyone pay that? And someone someone said in the chat, why don't you just buy the parts and build it yourself? Or you know, you could buy the parts and they're like, Mr. Steele deserves to be compensated for his design. He is being compensated. He, those are his motors. That's his camera. He works for TBS and ethics and he is compensated when you buy the parts. That's why he made a build video. He made a build video for the TBS sells the kit. You can get the exact parts from TBS. His build video that he made for that is on that product page. So he must be okay with you. If you don't want to pay get FPV $300 to build it, and, and he gets a royalty out of that, although I'm not sure why he gets a royalty for the motors, and then he also gets a royalty when get FPV builds it for him, but that's, that's between them. That's not whatever. You get money when you can. Um, if you want to just build it yourself, you could, uh, you could pay someone else a hundred dollars to build it for you and still come out ahead. And you know, either way he gets compensated. So I'm not going to try to improve on his design though. I couldn't, I could, I could, I could change it to my design, which I wouldn't say is better or worse. All righty. Ooh, Cosmic Scenes wants help getting his QX7 working. No stick movements in beta flight. Yeah, but you, Cosmic Scenes, good luck with getting help with this in the chat, but more power to you. Um, you need to tell everybody what flight controller you have. The number one thing I would say to check Cosmic Scenes is uh, in your receiver, in your receiver, um, how are you using the SBUS outwire? Many uh, SBUS... Free Sky receivers have both an SBUS in and an SBUS out, and people use the wrong one. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I gotta say, I don't, I don't, I understand if you look at the markup on the steel build and go, I don't understand why it's worth 300 extra dollars to have someone build it for me. But I also don't in any way begrudge steel and get FPV for charging what's fair or what they think they can get because 
it, I mean, to some degree, it's just an ultra premium product. And when you have an ultra premium product, you pay an ultra premium for it. And many people couldn't build it themselves. Like, I, I say that, here's why I say that. Let me be real here. People, when, when, when people ask me to do consulting, like if you, if you reach out to me and you say, I have a drone company, I need some help with this job that a client's working on. I will answer your questions all day long for free. But when a company reaches out to me and I'm like, okay, you're, you're, I'm going to support your business. I need you to support my business. I charge $100 an hour consulting rate. And part of that is because I don't really like doing that kind of work. I would rather be answering your emails. But then so I'm like, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna drop everything and talk to you on the phone for an hour, that's how much it costs to, to get me to do it. And some people look at that and they go, Wow, that is I could do that for fifty bucks. More power to you. More power to you. You charge what you think is worth to you to do the thing. If I say to you, How much is it gonna cost you to eat this worm? Some of you are gonna go, Oh my god, no, I'm not some of you would be like, Ten bucks, I'll eat the worm. Some of you will be like, no, no amount of money in the world would make me eat a worm. Everybody's price is different for doing anything. So if if it's 300, if Get FPV and Mr. Steel say it's 300 bucks to build this quad, more power to them. I don't think anybody should be. If you think that's too much money, don't give them your money. And if you think that's a fair price, give them your money. <laughs> Jay Seahorn, you're exactly right. The fact is, if people think it's too expensive, they won't buy it, and the price will come down if it doesn't sell. Or the price will stay the same, and it won't sell. You know? Yeah. I, uh... I think, uh, if you manage to find some degree of success in this world then by all means make the most of it because uh success is fleeting in a lot of cases and um you know how much job security does mr Steele have compared to let's just say like a federal government worker with a pension he has none so this year makes a lot of money selling I don't know whatever he does next year who knows get it while you can anyway Mr. Shady says $100 an hour to build a quad is fair considering they can earn that doing something else yeah that's the thing Mr. Shady there are people out there who will build a quad for you for 20 or $30 an hour some people might want a little more but if you ask me to build a quad for you I'm gonna I mean, I'm probably not gonna do it I'm gonna hand it off to somebody else who would who likes doing that um, but I, the, it's what else could you be doing with that time? So anyway, let's not talk about that anymore. Let's move on. <sighs> PK windsurf 12. Thank you for $20 in the super chat. I hope, was that you with the QX seven question? Did I get it right? That would be amazing if that did. Otherwise, thank you for the super chat. Martin Bennett, do you think the Tango 2 will have less latency than the T16 Radio Master with Crossfire module? Um, Martin Bennett, the main reason why an open TX radio like the, T like the Radio Master uh, would have more latency is because of a bug. They don't call it a bug. Uh, let's just call it an inefficiency in open TX. Crossfire Shot fixes that bug. So if you are running Crossfire Shot on a t16 or or other uh, then i think you're fine i don't i don't know this for a fact but um the tango 2 has lower latency because they incorporated crossfire shot into it that's my understanding so um i i think you can get at, right now the crossfire shot firmware is not ro rolled into OpenTX. it's supposed to be rolled into OpenTX in version 2.4 but 2.4 is not available yet it's sort of on the in the future um, you can run Crossfire Shot on the T16 and the Radio Master by installing the T16 firmware, though. So I think the latency will be about the same. How do you guys with mustaches deal with drinks? I'm just like, after every drink. Okay. 
Amateur Threat 99 thanks for $5 in the Super Chat. What's the average markup on FPV products? Is it like double wholesale costs normally, or do FPV companies run thinner profits? Um, Amateur Threat 99, um, I feel uh, pretty comfortable. I mean, I, I would never try to boil it down to like just one number, except I'm about to do that, because the margin is different on different products. Um, so some manufacturers have very, very thin margins. Uh, when you buy a, you know, a, a Chinese special, it's like when I, when I did the Tyro 119 build video, I said to some of the stores here in the US, can you carry this so people in the US can buy it without having to order from overseas? And the stores that I talked to said the margin on the Tyro 119 is so low that they can't afford to sell it. So some products have lower margins than others. Some products have higher margins. Um, the best margins are going to be on, like, if you look at GetFPV, and GetFPV has their house brand, which is Xylo, and their house brand, which is Lumineer. The absolute best margins are going to be products, and look at Rotor Riot. They have the Rotor Riot hype train motors, or the blaster motors or the CL1 frame. The best margins are gonna be on products that they develop in-house because then they capture both the retail and the distribution margin, um, as opposed to if you're just a distributor or a reseller, then you're only getting the retail margin. A, a rule of thumb that I work off of is that the wholesale margin is about, f in other words, the, the, the manufacturer makes about, takes about half the retail price and the store takes about 25% of the retail price. Um, that doesn't mean that that's gravy, obviously. The manufacturer has to pay the cost of making it and pay their own corporate overhead. Next batch in July, ouch. Thank you, Alep, for that information. Uh, and then the store obviously has to take their, their margin as well, and, and they have their own costs. So that's that's the rough numbers I use, though. 50% to the manufacturer, 25% to the store. Where's the other 25%? What am I doing wrong here? That doesn't add up to 100%. So I've, I've clearly screwed up somewhere. Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> um... Bob VW, thanks for five bucks in the super chat. Love the Tiny Hawk freestyle, but I found the Diatone GTR 349 too fast. Uh, Bob VW, here's what I would do, man. You already own the 349. You may as well work with it. Use a throttle limit in Betaflight. You can you can go to the CLI and set up a throttle limit, and uh, you can lower your throttle to like 75%, and that'll slow it down. The other thing to do is to reduce your up tilt. Okay, those two things will slow it down. You'll have less power to the motors and less speed, and I would I would really do that before you try to just buy another quad. Burritos Yum Yum, best username. Burritos Yum Yum, thanks for five bucks in the super chat. Why do bent props sometimes cause the drone to uncontrollably gain altitude? Uh, Burritos Yum Yum, the PID controller is reading the gyro data and then trying to raise and lower the motors to cause the quad to fly correctly. When you have too much vibration, the D term amplifies the vibration and the PID loop, basically it's like when you go up to a microphone and the microphone feeds back. That's basically what happens. The vibration from the motors feed back into the PID loop. The PID loop amplifies the motors and you get this basically feedback, just like when a microphone goes, ee, your quad flies to the moon. Um, that's why, that's the short version. Country Boy FPV, is the Cadex Micro good? It came in FPV crate. I think you mean the Cadex Nebula. Do you mean the Cadex Nebula? I want to tell you guys, Cadex Nebula. I reviewed the Cadex Nebula. Nope. There we go. Wrong. I reviewed the Cadex Nebula this week. Cadex did a really confusing thing with the Cadex Nebula. The Cadex Nebula Nano is a DJI Vista only camera. The Cadex Nebula Micro can do both. Here we go. Gray's a good picture. It can do both analog and DJI, not at the same time. So, like, people are out there reviewing the Cadex Micro as an analog camera, and it's not bad. I didn't like the Cadex Nebula Nano 
as a DJI camera, but people are like, I got it in FPV crate and I'm mad. I think you got this one as an analog camera. It's not bad. It's not bad. It's the, it's the, and, and, and so you might ask, well, why, why didn't I mention that in my review? And the truth is, I didn't know. I, they said, hey, can we send you the Cadex Nebula na Nebula for review? And I said, sure. And they sent me the Nano. No one mentioned the, the micro even existed uh, until like literally I didn't even know it existed until as I was about to release the video, I was like looking up information about it. I was like, what is this? But uh, there you go. So this is a fine analog camera. If you got it in the FPV crate, don't be mad. Um and I, I put a note, I put a note in the video saying, hey, this, ha or I think it's in the comments. This has nothing to do with the Cadex Micro, but, you know, it's, it already happened. Amateur Threat 99 thank you for $10 in the super chat. I need an easy to build 20 by 20 stack with 30 amp and 4S ability. We talked about the Rush Mini. Uh, the problem with the Rush Mini we talked about was that it has pins. If you have a pinned connection, between your flight controller and your ESC, chances are good that eventually those pins will wear out and stop making contact. I guess what you could do, Amateur Threat, is you could soft mount the whole stack. I like the Rush Mini stack. I, I don't have a ton of 20 by 20 stacks off the top of my head, and 30 amps is a little bit much to ask, but 20 by 20s have been getting more and more robust. Um, but the other one I would look at would be the iFlight. iFlight seems to have a pretty good track record. Gemini, thank you for 549 euros. No, no question. Just uh, Aqua Studio, thank you for 549 Canadian. Andy Shin, thank you for Andy Shin, by the way, not Andy Shen, the famous frame designer. Is it possible to fly one-handed? Any resources for disabled pilots? Yes, Andy Shin. I want to introduce you. Oh, wrong window. There we go. It's going to keep happening. I want to introduce you to Captain Uno. Captain Uno, that is, by the way, his chosen pilot name. So, no, I don't want anybody to think I'm making fun of him. Andy Shin, I would never make fun of the captain. Uh, this guy, Captain Uno, he is one-handed and flies. You can check out this Rotoride episode where um, Chad Nowak went and met him. And here's how he does his setup. Um, oh, I, I went to just the right part. Now, if you're looking for a custom controller, the other thing to look for is what's called a single stick controller. So look up uh, Tyrannus single stick mod. Uh, and and there's a thing called a single stick mod, which you would want to look at, which lets you have throttle yaw and roll and pitch. I'm not sure how it works, but it puts yaw, I think, on this. Yeah, it puts um, throttle on one stick and then yaw pitch and roll on the other stick so uh as far as resources go though uh, maybe you could even reach out to him and say hey can you help but you can see how he does it he just flies one-handed amateur threat 99 thanks for five dollars in the super chat there's too many super chats stop stop super chatting you guys it's too much yeah. Uh, um, what do you think about the FPV Cycle Cinesplore frame and the associated 20203 motors? Um, this is fascinating. Bob Ruge is a madman, and he is coming up with some crazy, crazy stuff. Uh, I have to probably defer to his amazing uh, his skill. This is a very lightweight Cinewhoop-style frame. And here's what's interesting is he's got these new 2203 motors. 2203, how, how long? Oh, crap. Bob, your link's broken, my friend. And these are designed for 3-inch, I think? These pancake-style motors, practically. No top end, but lots of torque. And can even uh, take a 5-inch prop if it's very light. I'm intrigued. I don't like, you're not going to get me to say, oh yeah, there's, here's what's wrong with this. Because Rugi is such, he's so detail oriented. Not all of his products are perfect in every way, but they all are deserving of, of respect and attention. I would have to fly it before I really had an opinion. Let's see here. Bolivia FPV, thanks for 25 uh, Bolivars. 
Uh, just updated my quad to Betaflight 4.2, but my LQ changed to something like numbers and points. That is correct. Um, it used to be that LQ was reported as an RSSI value from 0 to 300%. And now it, that was actually a synthetic metric. Um, LQ, there's a thing called RF mode, which goes from 0 to 4, I believe. And a thing called, and then an LQ. So it, your LQ is the second one of those numbers, the 100. And then the number is your RF mode. And as long as your RF mode is higher than, is it RF mode three or two that is you're about to fail safe? Basically the first RF mode, the highest one is 150 Hertz. Then as it drops down to three, I think you're at 50 Hertz. And then you go down to like four Hertz. Uh, TBS people are crying right now because I'm getting the details wrong. But the LQ, the RF mode is the first number, and the LQ is the second number, and that's uh, what you're seeing there. Betaflight didn't used to show you the actual stats. Now they do, so that's what you want. Bolivia FPV, thank you for uh, 50 boulevards. Oh, same same, same, uh, same person. Um, I tried to update the font without battery connected. How can I fix it to what it used to be? No, you can't do that. You can't fix it to what it used to be, Bolivia. You can't do it. It's just changed in beta flight. But it's better this way. It's better this way. Because you're actually getting the information you need. Nicola Sarcella. Thank you for five. Uh, probably not Italian with uh, Swiss francs. Can I transmit GPS telemetry to my FSI 6S and display it? Um, I don't think so. I don't think the FSI 6 has like advanced telemetry display for GPS and stuff. I don't think that radio can do that. You could do it in the OSD, though, but you know that. All right. Woo! Mm. So many super chats. I'm finally caught up. Let's see. Let's get some more questions from the YouTube chat. Let's see. Any questions? What iNav does the Bardwell flight controller run? Nikhil Parikh. Parikh. Uh, it does not run iNav. The Bardwell flight controller doesn't have an iNav target. You cannot run iNav on it. Skadoosh, going back to when I said soft mount the flight controller. Skadoosh, a pin connection does need a hard mount between the boards. You are correct. I didn't mean to soft mount between the flight controller and the ESC. I mean that the flight controller and the ESC pin together with a hard mount, and then both of them together are soft mounted to the frame to reduce the shock and vibration that they take. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to clarify that. Uh, Keylitho, Keylitho, Key am I going to tune the Sedora on 4S with 2450 kV motors? No, I don't have, I don't have 2450 kV motors for it. I don't have the 4S version of it. I probably am not going to, I mean, I've tuned it on 4S with 1800 kV motors and I've tuned it on 6S with 1800 kV motors. I'm probably not going to go tune it a third time. Uh, so. Any news on OpenTX 2.4? Uh, I cannot wait till OpenTX 2.4 comes out, but I don't know if there is a... Uh... Let's look at their roadmap. Let's see if we can find their roadmap. Sometimes GitHub will have a roadmap. Um... Releases is 239. Oh, wow. 239. I mean, they're getting close, right? They're going to they're gonna run out of numbers, right? They released 239. 14 days ago. They got nothing to do now but release 2.4, right? Unless they're going to go 2.3.9.1. Hello? Where's the date for 2.3.4? Uh, I can't find it. Dang it. Oh, somewhere on... Dang it. Somewhere on... GitHub, you have to have a way. Oh, they'll just go for 2310. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, thank you, because this is not... You can just do 2310. This is not a... Yeah. 
right. I don't know why I thought that these were numbers. <sighs> what will OpenTX 2.4 bring to the table? Oh, crossfire shot, finally. That's good. Yeah. Um, Dragon Doggy. Dragon Doggy built his Bardwell Tyro 119. Now how do I get the DJI Air unit on it? You don't. That frame is not going to take a DJI Air unit, my friend. You are, you are, no, don't, don't put a DJI Air unit on the Tyro 119. Get a proper frame that's designed for it. Oh, Archangel reminds us that OpenTX 2.4 will bring support for touch screens. So radios that have touch, oh, oh yeah, the freaking FlySky Nirvana will finally have OpenTX support. Kind of a big deal. Lucas Syest says, my flight controller is blinking red after a crash. No startup beeps. Can't arm or connect to beta flight. Is it dead? I think you already know the answer to that, my friend. It's blinking red, so it's got power. If it was just off, maybe it isn't getting power. But it's blinking red. It won't connect to beta flight, and you crashed. I hate to give you the bad news. It's dead. Skadoosh, no problem, man. I'm, I really appreciate you, yeah, pointing that out about the, the pins and the soft mount. Michael Bauer, thank you for five euros. You're my favorite YouTuber, and I want to support you. Oh, thank you, Michael Bauer. If I'm your favorite YouTuber, you got to get out more, dude. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. Um, like, there's so many great YouTubers out there. I, I'm, 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 I'm honored to be your favorite. Uh, can you tell my son that I'm your favorite YouTuber, though? Because he doesn't think. Uh, no, he's he's impressed. He's impressed, but he'd be more impressed if I played Minecraft or Roblox or Fortnite. What are you gonna do? Uh, Aminor Threat 99 thanks for $5 in this super chat. My RSSI isn't showing in the OSD on the Diatone R349. Do I bind the controller with telemetry enabled? Uh, it depends on what uh, receiver you have, Aminor Threat. Not all receivers will support RSSI display and reporting. If you have the RXSR, then you can get RSSI working, but you would need to set it up on an aux channel. Um, yeah. If you have Crossfire, then it should work natively. So whenever you say RSSI isn't working, the answer is you got to ask what receiver it is first. Rudged, Rudged has a great question in the YouTube chat. My Crossfire RSSI is never at 99. Have you guys noticed ever since like Betaflight 4.1, Crossfire doesn't have 99 RSSI anymore? I should do a video about this. Hang on, I'm going to make a note to myself. Note to self. Make video. I already did that. I'm going to make a note about crossfire. Crossfire incoming. So here's the deal. Your RSSI was never 99. Your RSSI was never 99. It was lying to you. Oh, hang on. Don't freak out. I'm just, I'm just clickbaiting you. Um, before Betaflight 4.1, Betaflight didn't report LQ and RSSI separately. Betaflight relied on the Crossfire receiver to tell Betaflight what the RSSI or LQ was. And most of the people set it up with LQ and RSSI combined. Now, RSSI is the raw signal strength. LQ is the signal quality. Here's I'm going to give you an example of signal strength versus signal quality. Signal strength is how loud my voice is right now. Now I'm going to start reducing my signal strength and I want you to tell me how the signal quality is. So can you guys still understand what I'm saying? I've just reduced the volume on my You guys don't turn your volume up. Can you guys still understand what I'm saying? Yeah, my, so my RSSI is low, but my LQ is fine. RSSI is really low, you probably can still understand what I'm saying. Okay. So, LQ would stay at 99% for a long time, even as your RSSI dropped. And in Betaflight 4.0 and earlier, you would just see 99%. Okay. 
So now in 4.1 and newer, Betaflight is actually showing you RSSI and LQ separately. And now you're seeing, oh my God, my RSSI, why is it so low? It, it, it was always that low, but don't freak out because as long as your LQ is okay, you don't have to worry about it. As long as your LQ is above, let's say 80% for sure, like if it's above 90%, don't even look at RSSI. And if your LQ gets down between 90 and 80%, now maybe something's up. And if your LQ gets below 80%, then you should probably think about coming home because you might fail safe. But RSSI, RSSI drops off very abruptly and then it levels off and plateaus. It's a, it's a DB, it's a logarithmic curve. So you won't see 99% RSSI unless the two antennas are like practically touching. If they're even 10 feet apart, your RSSI is gonna be down around like 80 or something, unless you're like at two watts. Mm. It's a great question. If you see 99, here's the thing, RSSI, it's just physics. As distance increases, RSSI must go down. So if you fly a kilometer away and your RSSI is still 99, you're not seeing RSSI. Okay. A minor threat, I see, I see. I keep saying a minor threat. It's a minor threat. Named after the band. Thank you for $5. A minor threat. Steve Meyer, thank you for $5. A minor threat. Thank you for $2. I have the RXSR. Okay. A minor threat. What you need to do, number one, you do need to bind in telemetry enabled mode. Otherwise, you won't get RSSI to the radio. And then a minor threat. Here is the method you need. This is how you get RSSI into the OSD. Yeah, Jay Moider, apologize for mangling your name there. Uh, RSSI drops quickly to like 70 or 80% and then much slower between 80 and uh, down to like 50%. That's how, that's how the logarithmic curve works. Steve Mayer, thank you for $5 in the super chat. I think I already got you. Bags FPV, thank you for $5. Bags, Bags already a patron, but thank you for the contribution. And General Zorg, thank you for five pounds. Thanks for helping me with my motor issues on 4.2 last week. Thank you very much. Doghouse FPV wants to know, what is the minimum bend radius of the coax cables that come with video transmitters? Uh, Doghouse, the, the minimum bend radius, you would have to look up the specs for the exact kind of coax. And, and different uh, pigtails come with different coaxes. The short version is that as long as it's not literally kinked, I don't worry about it. Um, any bend is going to slightly change the received signal strength. But at the end of the day, like if you just need the absolute most power possible, well maybe you shouldn't be using an MMCX connector at all, right? If you're So I wouldn't worry about it. As long as it's not literally kinked. The main place that bend radius comes into play, in my opinion, is at the... Um, at the ferrule that holds the coax to the SMA, if the bend radius is too tight, it will cut the metal ferrule that's swaged on there will cut the coax and it'll wear out and cut through over time. So I try and keep it so that there is not too much of a an angle right there where the coax exits the SMA. But other than that, I don't I don't worry about it too much. Let's see here. Magic FPV says, if my JB parallel board turns red, what do I do? I left it on the window ledge. Magic FPV, the paint on the polyfuses on the JB parallel board is thermal sensitive paint. The idea is that if the polyfuse trips and then the polyfuse gets hot, the paint will tell you that the polyfuse has tripped. It seems like you left the Poly, the parallel board on a window ledge and it got hot enough that the paint started to turn red but it doesn't mean anything just let it cool down and it'll turn back 
Foxer FPV, I missed you on the super chat? Oh no. Sorry about that, Foxer. Where were you? Oh my goodness. Wow. Oh, I'm very sorry about that, Foxer. Foxer FPV, thank you for five euros of the super chat. Having problems with uh, death rolls. My 4-in-1 ESCN motors are fine. You say that, but you're having death rolls. See, you can't... Um, I, 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 it's like people say, well, I, uh, I'm having fail-safes. And I say, maybe your receiver's broken. And they say, but it's brand new. Well, it could still be broken. So, um, like you say that the ESCN motors are fine, but I, w I don't know how we know that. So let's just not, let's not jump to uh, assumptions. The capacitor is dead. Capacitor is dead. Could this be the problem for death flips after fast rolls? If you have death flips after fast rolls, you if you are screwing with um, idle speed, that could be that your idle speed is too low. Um, if you're screwing with like dynamic idle, that could be a problem too. Um, but number so raise the idle speed, right? It's worth a try. If you've lowered your idle percent down to 3% because you're trying to get more hang time, then you raise that back up again. Um, but the number one thing that causes death rolls after fast rolls is a bad motor or ESC. Does it always roll the same direction? That's the first thing I ask. If it always rolls to the left but not to the right, then it's a motor on the left side that's a problem. Um, if it rolls either direction, then it's a more generalized problem like with the ESC or the flight controller. So um, Foxer, raise your idle speed. And then you say the ESC and motors are fine, but I don't know how we know that. I think the, the fact that the quad is death rolling suggests that the ESC or motors may not be fine. What kind of things cause RX loss? Asks Martas Tankving. Martas, um, RX loss can be caused by a lot of things. Um, you can generally break them down into two categories problems with the radio link and problems with the quadcopter. Problems with the radio link include you just flew too far or you flew uh, behind an obstacle. So those things can cause RX loss. Um, interference. Interference is not super likely, especially if you're flying 2.4 gigahertz control. If you're flying 900 megahertz control, some cell towers can, can be likely to interfere with you. Uh, and if you're flying near a cell tower, you could definitely get, get knocked out. Um, if you have a, problems with the quad, include damaged antennas, damaged receiver, receiver lost power. Those are basic things. Whenever you've got a fail safe like that, those are the those are the things I look at. The other question I ask is, is the problem happening on all of my quads or is it happening only on one quad? If it's happening only on one quad, then the controller is fine and the quadcopter, the receiver, the antennas are the problem. If it's happening on all of my quads, then probably my controller is messed up in some way. Lucifer 666, that's a username. Don't freak out. Thank you for five pounds in the super chat. My DJI Air Unit OSD is gone, but everything else works after a small crash. I connected my other Air Unit to the quad, and it works fine. Send back. Uh, my guess is, is the whole OSD gone or just the Betaflight OSD? If the whole OSD is gone, then yeah, I would just, I would, I would try to get a replacement or a repair. Um... If it's the Betaflight OSD, then it could be the pins, the TXRX pins in that. But yeah, if you replaced the air unit and then the OSD came back, then definitely just you need to reach out to DJI and see if you know they're going to warranty it or if you could get it repaired. A day at the range. Thanks for two dollars in the super chat. Is it okay to run four watt, two point four gigahertz on my X ninety plus? A day at the range is. I think you've been emailing me about this. A day at the range has a four watt, two point four gigahertz amplifier on his Tyrannus, and that's like the Tyrannus normally operates at a hundred milliwatts. Crossfire operates at two watts. 
he pardon me he's up at four watts so he's getting crazy range now before you think oh well, i'm gonna go buy a, a four watt 2.4 gig amplifier uh and i'm gonna try that uh you, you could do that it's not legal in the u.s it's definitely not i'm pretty sure it's not legal maybe it's legal could it be legal i don't know the other thing is uh that uh your telemetry is not going to work once you get in a far out your telemetry but maybe you don't care about that um i i don't think it's a good idea um but I mean, i'm not really sure why so maybe it's a good idea I'm not going to say, you asked me, is it okay? I'm not going to tell you it's okay. Mr. Tux, I, I, a lot of things are legal if you have a ham license. Um, but I remember reading, I can't remember. It's so bad that I can't remember. I looked this up once and I remember reading that there were reasons why. Because maybe it's, maybe it's legal. Yeah. Four watts is a lot of freaking power. Um, I can't think of a reason why it's not okay a day at the range, but at the same time, I don't endorse it. Let's let's go that way. Christopher Yachts, thank you for five dollars in the super chat. Can you suggest a middle power weight motor for five inch, something less than twenty two oh seven twenty three oh six, but still has sixteen by sixteen mounting, one hundred twenty eight grams without motors? You're trying to get an ultra lightweight motor. I mean, can you go down to like an 1806 or a 2206? Um, Lumineer makes some 2206 motors that are pretty decent. They're going to get you a little bit of lightweight. Um, if you're trying to stay under 250 grams, I'm, I'm sorry to say you're going to need to go even lighter than that, though. Four watts, illegal everywhere. I'm not sure about that, burned ESC. I mean, ham operators can transmit at really high output powers, but uh, the Tyrannus is not like a ham radio, so I'm not sure. Let's see here. Well, T1 Leddy, uh, what you found uh, doesn't necessarily mean... I'm not sure that there are a lot of there are a lot of caveats there. Greg wants to know. I have no split style HD cams on the shopping list. I don't. Um, I guess the only split style cam that I would put on the list would be the the Runcam Nano, the Split Nano, which I liked a lot. Um, but mostly, I don't have a micro section on the list, so that's why you don't see that there. Um, if you want a 20 millimeter board, I liked the Runcam Split Nano when I flew it on the HX115. I liked it a lot. In fact, I think that is a 20 millimeter, isn't it? In fact, here is, here's my, uh, Greg, here's my, here's a link to my review of it. This is my review of the Runcam Split Nano. Uh, and if you're looking for a 20 millimeter, which I think the Nano is, I, I recommend that. I mean, none of these Nano cams are perfect, but I thought that was pretty good. I thought it was pretty good. Uh, what's a split camera? Asks ProZ1 Full. Um, a split camera is a... It has HD recording on board and FPV analog output. So it records like 1080 HD on board, the, uh, but then standard definition output in a single camera. They call that a split cam. Well, Greg, I don't have a newer recommendation in recent months, but that's largely because I haven't flown any of the, I mean, maybe some of the newer cameras are better, but I haven't flown them. FPV bashing wants to know what capacitor should I add to my drone? I don't have a capacitor. I'm getting some interference with my new VTX. Um, 1,000 microfarad, 25 volts for 4S, 35 volts for 6S. That's a, the short version. How do you install capacitors on your drone? That's one of the big challenges. Um, 
There are a couple things that make it easier to install capacitors on the XT60, like a little PCB that solders onto the XT60 and then holds the capacitor. Um, it's not as effective if it's not on the ESC itself, but it still is effective some. Um, sometimes people will zip tie it to the battery cables itself themselves, but the problem is if the battery cable is wiggling around, it'll eventually break off the legs. Uh, sometimes you just leave it hanging, cross your fingers. Yes, uh, low ESR electrolytic capacitor. Good point, David Skadoosh. Um, don't just grab, you need an electrolytic capacitor and you want the low ESR kind. If you're not sure if it's low ESR, look for the temperature rating. The capacitors that are 105 degree temperature rated are basically always low ESR. Does the split camera have higher latency when recording on board? Um, I don't think the latency changes whether you're recording or not, but they do tend to have worse latency than like just analog cameras. Greg says, I put short wires between the cap and ESC, then zip tie the cap to a standoff. That's a great approach, Greg. Um, the wires between the cap and the ESC also slightly maybe reduce the effectiveness, but you would probably never notice. And by zip tying the, the capacitor to a standoff, the capacitor is then secure and you won't get any like shaking around or anything. Uh, but it often doesn't work on slam deck designs. The capacitor may be too tall on a slam deck design uh, to, uh, to do that. What's the best way to deal with frame resonance that's making it past the RPM filters? The noise is at 230 hertz. It messes with my roll D. Um, so Quadex, the first thing I would look for is I would go into the black box explorer and I would look if the noise is a vertical line, then that is frame resonance. Um, because in, let me see if I can like show you guys what I'm talking about here. Have I got any black box logs I could show you? Like just laying around? Hang on. Uh, let's try this one. Let's see if this has got what I need. Actually, let's go over to this screen. So here in Black Box Explorer, what you can do is the first thing you want to do is when you create the black box file, you need the debug mode set to gyro scaled. Otherwise, you don't get the pre-filtered gyro data. So you need debug set to gyro scaled in Betaflight. Otherwise, you can't see this data. In graph setup, you're going to set it to deep. Here, let me remove that. You're going to do add graph debug. And that's going to show the gyro scaled, and that's what you want. So then you're going to pick an axis, and you're going to hit this little button right here. And that's going to show you the spectral analyzer display for that axis. And I'm going to just expand it here to take the whole screen. Now what you normally will see is a diagonal swoosh, almost, of, of noise. And we're going to see that here on the roll axis, and we're going to see that on the pitch axis as well. What we're seeing here is the vertical axis is throttle position, the horizontal axis is frequency, and the brightness, the color axis, is the magnitude of the noise. So as you would expect, as the throttle goes up, the frequency of the noise goes up. And this is completely normal. Now, let me see if I can find a worse example of what, I, what I'm thinking about. Uh, something with some frame resonance. Ah, perfect. I'm so lucky. So this right here is an example of frame resonance. This horizontal swipe, what this is saying is, now notice we still have the, the diagonal swipe, right? Kind of. You can kind of see the diagonal swoosh here. That's your motors. 
But this vertical stripe here is saying that as you raise the throttle, the frequency of the noise is staying the same right at 130 maybe hertz. Okay? Now, what would cause the vibration to stay the same as the throttle goes up and down, as the motors go up and down? It's a resonant frequency. Think about anything. Like anything has a resonant frequency. If I tap this, it's making the same sound, isn't it? Making the same note. And even if I were to tap that to the point where I was making a vibration, that resonance would be the same, no matter if I tap it slow or tap it fast, okay? So what you're seeing when you get a vertical stripe like this is frame resonance. Now, if you've got frame resonance like that, one of the ways to solve it, and now we're getting to the question that Quadex asked, one of the ways to solve it is with a static notch filter in Betaflight. So Quadex, you can go into Betaflight, add a static notch filter, they're off by default, and you can just put it right where that resonance is and it'll slice it out. But that's a bad idea. It's, it's a last ditch effort. That's like saying, um, I, I need to finish this, this march to get supplies to the village. So I'm gonna put a splint on my broken ankle and hobble the rest of the way to the village. I mean, you can do it. It's not a good idea, but maybe it's necessary. Um, a notch filter like that is gonna increase your latency of your PID loop. And especially if you look at this log that I'm looking at, the noise is around 130 Hertz. Uh, the lower the notch, the more latency you get. Now you're up around 230 hertz, sorry about that. Uh, so that's not as bad, but what you really should do if you see a vertical swoosh like that is figure out why your frame has resonance. Quadex, I'm scared to ask, but what frame is it that you've got? What frame is it that you've got? Because there are some frames that have known resonance issues and it doesn't always cause problems. Many people fly these frames without knowing it Quadex, that's the frame that I'm not gonna I'm not gonna call out anybody because the last time I did that it blew up in my face and I don't want to repeat it. But that's the frame that has a known issue with resonance at around 220, 230 hertz. Now, many, many people fly that popular frame and don't have any problem with resonance. But the frame does have a consistent resonance and it always has. And sometimes what I would say is, yeah, if, if you are having that problem with that frame, there is nothing you can do except switch to a different frame. It just, that's inherent to that frame's design. There's nothing you can do about it. Okay. Backed me into that. The chat is welcome to guess which frame I'm talking about. I will not confirm or deny the guesses. <laughs> um, okay. Pri Priya Bharata, thank you for turning up. What is a good range of glass to glass latency for an analog system? Um, Priya Bharata, the, the uh, glass to glass latency. So we're talking camera to goggles, but not control link latency. Um, I would say that up to 35, 40, maybe 50 milliseconds is flyable. The question, what I think that late, what I think that latency does is the more latency you get, the more you rein in what you try to do. So you only, back when we were all flying really slow cameras with, with PPM input, we had terrible latency. The control, from the control input to the goggle, the latency might have been 60 or 70 milliseconds. I, I don't even think I'm exaggerating there. And we all thought, oh yeah, this is okay, this, we could do this. And the minute that we switched from PPM to S bus and the latency went down, suddenly we were like, oh, this is better. And as 
And then you start doing more things. You find out all the things you never even thought to do because you didn't think they were possible. So the less latency, the more you'll be able to push yourself. And it's only when you go from low latency back to high latency that then you're like, oh, this was awful. How did I ever live with this? But I think most of the systems that most people are working with today, glass to glass, are in the range of 16 to, say, 35 milliseconds, 15 to 35 milliseconds, roughly. And less than that, you probably would, you might be, oh, this is good. Um, don't forget you also have control latency as well, though. Kevin Poynton, thank you for five pounds. I can't get smart audio on two Mamba flight controllers to work uh, on TX3, on the TBS Nano Pro or Tramp. No smart audio, yes. Uh, Kevin, what you need to do is go into TBS Agent X. You're using, oh, you can't with the Nano. What you need to do, the, oh, you can't get the Tramp to work either. Okay, Kevin, if you're using the Tramp Nano, the new Tramp Nano, some people have had issues getting it working with Betaflight on F4 processors. That's a unique issue to the Tramp Nano. It's been acknowledged by Immersion RC. I don't know if a fix is out, but you need to go over to the Immersion RC Hub Facebook group. The name of the group is Immersion RC Hub, and you need to see if there's a fix for that issue with the Tramp Nano. Um, for the TBS Nano, TBS is shipping their new uh, Unifies set to Crossfire, not Smart Audio. Well, what that? Hang on, let me confirm that. Let me confirm that for the Nano before I before I give you bad information. Um, with the pinout. No, it just says Smart Audio. Crap. So that means it doesn't support Crossfire. So that's not the issue. Uh, now I think it's something you did. <laughs> uh, that's a tougher one. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I was going to take you one direction, but now I see that that's not true. Um, Kevin Poynton, uh, the, the short version is you need the smart audio pad wired to TX3 and then smart audio as your peripheral and you should see smart audio. Yes. Um, let's, uh, let's work on this a little more via email, Kevin, because then at this point I got to start probing questions and I don't have a simple answer for you. So thank you for your super chat. Email me. Blizzard FPV. Thanks for two Canadian dollars. BQE.io. It's a cheap plug, but there you go. Am I drinking? I'm drinking. Uh, what am I drinking? Am a minor threat. Thank you for $2 in the super chat. This is a uh, fruit punch Mio squirts. Blizzard FPV, thanks for two Canadian dollars. Roman Veronesi, thank you for 25 Swiss francs, I believe. Thank you so much for your work. You made it easy for me to get into FPV. Thanks for the mail where you checked the settings for my 6S battery on a 4S build. For sure. I'm glad I was able to help you. Kylie Fisher, thank you for five bucks. Is it Kyle or Kylie? I think it's Kyle. What do you think of the 1777 KV Umagod motors? Would you run them with quad props on 6S? Well, here's the thing, Kyle. Um... Those Umagod motors are made to work with Tommy's. Tommy has some quad props uh, made for them. Uh, but does he run? He runs. Does he run 5S or 6S on those motors? I would run 6S on 1777 KV all day. And on quad props, I'm personally not the biggest fan of quad props, but um, they have their place. They have their place. Um, I ran the HQ 5 by uh, 4.8 diameter, not 5 diameter, the HQ 4.8 inch 4-blade four, four prop, and I found it to be very, very controllable and very linear, but not have a lot of top end. Lewis Payne, thank you for five pounds in the super chat. Uh, thanks for all your great content. I have a Baby Hawk R Pro 4 inch. Where can I buy a mount for an action camera? Ouch. Uh, the Baby Hawk R Pro action. I don't. That Baby Hawk canopy is not really ideally suited. But I'm sure somebody has done it, right? Oof. That's going to be tough. Because, yeah. Um, what I would do. 
Let's just go to thingy first. Let's just search Thingiverse for Babyhawk 4-inch and see what we find. There's a shark fin. Um, let's try Babyhawk 4-inch GoPro. Nope. I don't know, man. Uh, you might be in custom development time here. Uh, I would... I would not sure everybody's going to disagree with me on this but i'm not sure i think the baby hawk the motors on that baby hawk are gonna are gonna not like the extra weight if you do put a gopro on there i'll tell you that i don't know if anybody makes an uh, action camera mount for that people in the chat are suggesting the insta 360 go the insta 360 go is so tiny it would get the job done if you really want a gopro man that's uh i think you're in custom custom design land 20 grams that's right you just got to be some way to stick it on there right how many props should i get for my drone asks quick fpv uh it doesn't matter you're going to run out. Buy as many as you can afford. You're going to break them. So. Hockey Alp Tekken wants to know what I think about the Dow floppy proppies. These are the Dow folding props. Um, I have some. I haven't tried them yet. Uh, Rotor Riot did a video where they tested them. And it looks to me like they fly okay. It looks to me like they fly okay. It's just a question of whether you want to be changing prop blades or not. Um, but uh, it seems like they're not like just garbage. It seems like they deliver. Uh, FPV Wannabe says they are self-destructive and don't last as long as standard props. Yes, they fly great and it's great for storage, but they chew themselves up, including by hitting the hub. That's the kind of thing I wonder. Uh, I wonder if props should just be considered consumable items. If you have this hub that needs to stay intact for the prop to be reusable. Mm. But um, I can't say for sure. I can say the ba the Rotorite guys were impressed by them. So. The Babyhawk R can easily carry a Session 5, says Ghost Branch FPV. It's the 4-inch. I think it could carry a session. I think it could carry a session. Um, Ryan Clawson wants to know if the J the QX7 can handle a crossfire module on two watts through its JR module bay without being damaged. I don't know the answer to that, Ryan. Uh, you, you used to need an external battery to run, I think it's higher than 500 milliwatts. Maybe it's up to 500 milliwatts. Um, and, uh, then they were like, well, it's, I guess it's up to you. Um, does anybody in the chat who runs Crossfire know if you can run two Watts output power without damaging a QX7? Midnight says, when's the giveaway result? It was last week. I posted it on my channel. Hit that bell, guys. If you're missing my giveaway announcements and you're missing the winners of the giveaway, it means that you didn't hit that bell. No. The giveaway has been announced. Sorry, you missed it. Diversity channel. You are spamming the chat, my friend. That's not how to get an answer. That's just how to get a timeout. Hackeroni Italiano wants to know whether the Sedora SL5E is worth a couple extra bucks over the Nazgul. Um, the, the Sedora SL5E and the Nazgul are very, very similar. I think that the Nazgul was a Banggood exclusive, whereas the SL5E is sold other places. Uh, I would probably get the SL5E, but tr the truth is there isn't that much difference between them. I just think iFlight is sort of more committed to the... It feels like they're more committed to the Sedora line. And I think the Nazgul was like a, I don't know. Nobody nobody had the Nazgul except Banggood when I when I looked for stores to link to. So the Sedora is everywhere. The Nazgul was only at Banggood. I think I would lean toward the Sedora. Quick 
Aquatics is asking about my asking about my quadcopter retrieval video. Aquatics has been looking at my my editorial calendar. You guys may not know this. Uh, I have an editorial calendar on my website. It's not linked. You have to know the URL. I haven't I haven't decided whether like how I'm gonna integrate it or not. But the editorial calendar shows my current plans for uh, my videos coming up. And he has noticed that the drone retrieval video is scheduled for the ninth. Yeah, I put things on the schedule to force myself to get them done in time. So that is, I gotta get, get working on that. <laughs> the schedule is not set in stone, far from it. I often reshuffle it, but I try to keep the schedule reflecting my current plans for what's gonna come out when. If you're waiting for a specific video, it may get moved around depending on things, but uh, you can at least see what I'm thinking is going to happen. Redbeard the pilot points out that even at a, at a hundred milliwatts, Crossfire just sucks the life out of his battery, so you need an, he needs an external battery anyway. Bolivia FPV, thanks for another 25 bolivars. I changed my VTX from Tramp to Unify V3. When I download the VTX table and upload to Betaflight, it appears white. Any suggestions? Um, the file that you're uploading is corrupted. It's not the right format. Um, so something about the way you're copy-pasting the file is not working. Um, that... I, I, without like looking over your shoulder at exactly how you're saving the file, like maybe you're saving the HTML file by accident. Um, what I always like to do is copy paste, and you can you can load the VTX table from the clipboard, and I just highlight the text and copy and paste it. Thank you, Studio eighty nine, for five uh, Swiss francs, I believe. A minor threat wants to know. Thank you for two more dollars there, a minor threat. Vanover swears by his Futaba radio link. Your thoughts? I mean, yeah. Vanover doesn't fly Crossfire anymore because he's so happy with the, the with the link range on his 2.4 gigahertz Futaba. And he could fly Crossfire. His Futaba radio supports it. Um, I haven't, like, tested it, but it makes sense to me that Futaba would have some of the best. They, they just, they know Futaba don't make no crap. Um, unfortunately, Futaba, number one, Futaba is super expensive, and I try to keep my day-to-day -day gear, uh, you know, I try to keep up with the, with the, with the little people out there. Um, okay, okay, I, it's, I mean, so I have HDO2 goggles, which are the top, top, top of the line goggles, but then I have like a hundred dollar transmitter, so I don't know. I really like OpenTX, that's the thing, Futaba doesn't support OpenTX, so... Uh, but yeah, Futaba, Vanover swears by his Futaba. And I said, well, you're running Crossfire. He's like, nope, run Futaba. Go figure. Thank you, uh, Kinjuru Gi. Thank you for five pounds. He says, mm, black box analysis. Show me more, baby. Anders Martinson, the little number next to LQ is your RF mode. RF mode. Two is 150 hertz. One is 50 hertz. Doesn't it go higher than two? No, oh, maybe not. Guess not. Futaba is expensive and slow to move at the times, but very good, says Mez303. I, I, I mean, Futaba will never support OpenTX, but I really like OpenTX. Futaba makes great hardware, and their operating system is probably fine, but OpenTX, baby. Does he think Futaba is advantageous for racing? I mean, I don't know. You'd have to ask him that. You'd have to ask him that. Diversity Channel says, Mr. Steel Build getting hot motors in the last three days. Don't know why. Help. Um, Mr. Steel runs really aggressive PIDs, Diversity Channel. So if your quad has any extra vibration if any of the motors is out of balance if you have a crack in the pl in the frame if you have a loose standoff if if you have any sources of additional vibration you'll start to get hot motors that's that's the answer that's what i'd be searching for if i had hot motors on a mr steel build
Oliver Coates, thank you for five pounds. I'm looking at a five inch 6S Vista build to carry a GoPro 8. The frame is 20 by 20 holes. Would an iFlight 40 amp twin G be okay with, say, 2306 1777K motors? Um, yeah, a 40 amp ESC will handle any five inch prop most of the time. Um, the question is how hard you're going to be able to work that ESC before you pop it. So if you, I mean, think about 40 amps, that's 160 amps peak. How often do you pull 160 amps peak? Like ever. For how long? Not long. So really a 40 amp ESC on paper is okay, but then when you have to turtle mode and you're banging the ground with your props, then you're maybe, especially if it's a 20 by 20 ESC, you're going to be more likely to pop it. So on paper, that ESC is okay, but you may not be able to abuse it as much as you could abuse a 60 amp ESC. But if you're limiting yourself to 20 by 20, 40 amps is, you know, you're just going to have to do your best. Do your best to not pop it. Yes, it would be okay, but also it's going to be more likely to pop than if you had like a 30 millimeter 60 amp ESC. Mike Bergman, thank you for $5 in the Super Chat. How forgiving is the VAS Crossfire Pro flexible antenna as far as mounting it goes? I thought I'd find more info about it, but it's a little vague. Um, Mike, the thing is, if you're using that VAS Crossfire Pro flexible antenna, it, you, could, you can mount it anywhere you like. If it's mounted behind the frame, it is going to reduce the range. You definitely don't want it inside the frame. And if you can get it up above the frame, that's better, but it may be more likely to get torn off in a crash. Um, I mean, that antenna isn't magic. It still is subject to the laws of physics, but if you mount that flexible antenna the same place you would mount an immortal... Uh, I say that. I don't know if I would mount that antenna at the end of an arm. It feels like that flexible antenna at the end of an arm is maybe going to have issues. I would probably mount it like like he shows in the video and start there. Where do you want to mount it? That's the question, Mike. Cody Lambert, thank you for 666 Canadian. My Insta360 corrupts footage changed to SD to highest transmission rate still happens. More corrupts with the 360 mod. What's going on? Uh, Cody, that's a tough one. I guess I would update the f firmware? I don't know about that, man. Uh, I haven't had that problem and I don't know how widespread it is um, a, a, a UHS 3 card is the fastest card it's certainly fast enough I guess the question is like is maybe your SD card holder is messed up or maybe your camera's messed up I'm sorry man I wish I had more information for you if you're using a fast SD card yeah then I don't know what to say update the firmware Cody A minor threat, thanks for $5 in the Super Chat. Wants a video comparing radio link latency for Futaba, Crossfire, etc. A minor threat, this is, the only real way to do that is with a spectra, a, uh, an oscilloscope, and you can measure the latency, but um, I'm not really set up to do that, so I'm going to leave that to the guys like RC Shim and Drone Mesh and other oscilloscope guys. Um, oh, good point. Cody Lambert, thank you very much for the suggestion from Anthony Andrews. Cody Lambert, whenever I have – I don't know why I didn't think of this. Thank you, Anthony Andrews, for putting it in my mind. Uh, whenever I have problems with an SD card, the number one thing I do is format the SD card inside the camera, not on my PC. Even if it should be the same, sometimes it's not. So, Cody, put that card in the Insta360 and format it. And In fact, I make a habit before I go to fly – I put the card in the camera and I format the card. Um, and it's it has saved me problems in the past. i uh, just make sure that the card is empty. I'll show you my little tip. What I do is I have one SD card holder for full card for empty cards and one SD card holder for cards with footage on them. And when I go on a trip, I take the card out of the camera and I put it in the footage holder 
And then when I empty the footage on the PC, I put it back in the empty folder. So if a card is in here, it's safe to format. And then I just format it right before I go to fly. Okay, we're coming up on the end. Wow, this stream has flown by, you guys. Thank you so much for uh, for the great stream. Uh, we're coming up four minutes to the end of the stream, but don't worry if you are uh, you still want to get more stream in your building or you're f listening to the stream in the background while you do something. Uh, Aaron Ciotti is in the chat. Ciotti, FPV, C-I-O-T-T-I, FPV. He's going to be streaming on his channel starting uh, just about whenever I go off the air. So, uh, uh, Ciotti, start posting that link. What are you doing uh, this week, Ciotti? Hmm. All right. Am I streaming tomorrow? I don't know why I wouldn't. Uh, is something going on tomorrow that I should know about? Monday night at 8 p.m. will be my next stream. He's got the Sunday Q&A Acrobat Duo build. Very nice. So he's going to be streaming in just about three minutes when I go off the air. Oh, here's a good, here's a, here's a suggested mounting method from one of my patrons over in the Discord. Yeah, that's, that's kind of how he, wow, oh, oof, wow, okay. There's a lot I don't like about this, but it's your, it's your build, so I'm going to defer to the person who's actually doing it. Uh, I don't like that it's touching the carbon. That is going to affect the uh, coverage pattern, but then again, Crossfire has such ridiculous range that it kind of doesn't matter, so maybe it's okay. The other thing I worry about is that it's uh, going to get damaged. Like, you see, how, you see how these screws are all scraped up? Like, I guess it's being protected and I'm not getting scraped up, and we would see that it was. But I usually – it's a very interesting mounting method. I think there's a lot to dislike about that, but if it works, then hey, who cares? Um, that's all that really matters. I also notice you've got the screws going through here. Very interesting. Probably better with a TPU shim. Yeah, TPU shim would get it away from the carbon, but then it would get it closer to the ground. You may, you may have really hit something here. Yeah. Very interesting. 2.59 p.m. All right, that, we're going to go out on that note. Aaron Ciotti is posting uh, links to his chat, his uh, stream that will be starting in just a minute. Uh, he's putting 1804 3500 KV motos on the duo. Very interesting. Um, I will see you guys tomorrow at 8 p.m. I'll be streaming. There will be a link to that up uh, soon and uh, elsewhere on the Internet and on my channel. Thank you so much for coming out. Thanks for watching and um, happy flying, you guys. That's going to do it for the stream. Have a great day, everybody.